downtown and do long sort of, you know, going to this gallery, going to this gallery, do this sort of thematic thing, bring in my favorite comic books, anything I wanted, you know. Um, and then finally, I, I published this piece about pornography. Um, I hope it's not too shocking. And it, it's actually written by a character in one of my stories, and then who, who started out as a kind of heavy metal Satan worshiper, and then she became a nun. Uh, her name's Hannah Crawford. And uh, this is her letter to Mayor Giuliani. <laughs> and it was published in this magazine. They didn't ask about it. He never even asked a question. It was printed. And it's a, a letter to Giuliani protesting, or at least commenting on the law that happened. I think this is around 94 or something, where uh, suddenly new dancing was forbidden in New York. So it's sort of in response to that. It's called the De Por Pornographica of Hannah Crawford. They actually, they actually only printed half in the magazine and then had a little note at the end saying, the rest is online. One of the many inventions of willful silence, perhaps none would seem so idiosyncratic and particularly human, that is as much a clear and actual dividing line between ourselves and the other beasts, is pornography. Man is the animal who invented porn. That it was first perfected by the willed silence of the Victorian English has been roundly established by scholars of more experience and expertise in these matters than I. The works of Tassad, Rochester, and the thousand anonymous bawds whose subversive writings preceded the Victorian age differed from its pornographers in the following significant manner. The cultures from which they wrote were not geared toward the complete establishment of massive infidelity, as have been both the 19th and 20th centuries. Their works presented moral views, moral systems which we may or may not find tasteful and profound. The substance of their writings was part of that larger program. These early pornographers faced public condem condemnation for their beliefs. Operating in a non-silenced environment, they helped transform the larger cultures they assaulted or, in the case of some of the pagans, upheld. Attempts to silence them came as a response to the articulation of their work. Tassad himself wrote his masterpiece on matchbooks in jail and believed it lost when the Bastille was stormed. Perhaps the revolution was enough. No, a guard found the work and saved it, and 100 Days of Sodom found its way into the private library of a secret collector of erotica. Tassad never knew it had been saved. But he was interested in anal sex, I, I said something else, by and large, as well as whippings, and didn't seem to mind. Pornographic literature was itself not the end he desired. By not being permitted, that is, by the culture's willingness to destroy, deny, and argue with these works, even in so-called revolution, the works found a historical role that had much to do with the best elements of the liberation we enjoy today. Meanwhile, what fish can be found peering at two-dimensional renderings of fish anuses? Today's pornography is permitted. The situation allows it to breed in the service of no said ideas. In this situation, notions of rights and certain inevitable options are at the service, oddly, of pornography and not people at all, putting the writer actually concerned with sexuality in an odd position. Our rights need to expand outward, not inward. They need not apply to us, but to those we believe are not included in the category us. It seems strange to be reading this, if you know what I mean. Yet since the first appearance of pornography, it has become necessary for each novelist of integrity to turn his lens upon the sexual behavior of his subjects. So what if that lens helps make the fire? Such material is of great interest to the reader, naturally, and literature today finds its role as the maker of fancy porno. It masks its own pornographic impulse and becomes the kind of mask behind which a reader can hide to indulge in the material she's too afraid to be seen owning, sir. There is also a proliferation of erotic literature, an object that the reader can utilize to inflame the genitals, Mr. Mayor, at the same time her taste and sensibility are flattered. Clearly, the more one indulges in such surrogates to sexual activity, the more one is in fact neutered by them, which sounds kind of sexy to a nun, let me tell you, or placed in an onanistic agony of complete and perpetual repetition in which one's own sexual self is silenced. The great consumers of heterosexual pornography are of course prisoners, and it's no stretch to imagine every peruser of such material as being behind metaphor, metaphoric lock and key. One finds in an actual prison, by the way, a complete absence of homosexual pornography, for homosexual activity is available to all. How ironic that within the walls of prison one is more free in this regard than out without. By the way, Mr. Mayor, masturbation is great. We should all do it. Nuns do, I assure you. It's natural and feels good. Often we help each other. 
one should simply participate in a swap meet that contains a number of gigantic oddities. <laughs> she wrote that. Pornography breeds silence with us in regards to ourselves. Every moral citizen knows what pornography is, sees it at the newsstands, truck stops, and these days, I'm told, except in New York City, in the occasional bar. The silence about sex that created pornography in the first place maintains its impact, its casual, complete snuffing out of actual sexuality. In the face of porn, our lives are deprived of the freedoms of sexual action we seem to require, whether celibates, monogamists, or devotees of the orgy. We are removed from ourselves, adopting one of its finite set of roles maintained by pornography's categorizing union with silence. I don't really know what the hell I was trying to do in that piece. It's strange anyway. 